Well, welcome everyone. My name is Jana Schwartz. I'm the Assistant Dean for Development and Alumni Relations at the College of Fine Arts at BU. And we are delighted to welcome you to today's event, Theatrical Design, Page to Stage. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Boston University Alumni Association and the College of Fine Arts. We have just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available for on-demand viewing on the Alumni Association webpage. Our speakers are very eager to answer questions you may have. You're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A box. You can find that box hovering over your screen located on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom and you select Q&A. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the presentation and we're hoping this will be a conversational webinar. We have three fantastic speakers and I am delighted to introduce each of them. First, we have Jorge Arroyo. He is an assistant professor at BU in lighting design in the College of Fine Arts. He has been a freelance lighting designer for over 20 years and has worked in a variety of disciplines ranging from theater, dance, corporate events, concerts, to television and more. His work has been seen at venues such as the Apollo Theater, Carnegie Hall, the Public Theater, Westport Country Playhouse, Theater Squared, The People's Light, and Theater Company, Here, La Mama, Intar, and others. He has created designs for over 50 shows at both the New Jersey Performing Arts Center and Jazz at Lincoln Center for artists such as Alicia Keys, Gabriel Iglesias, the Wyans Brothers, the Chieftains, BB and CC Winans, Jackie Mason, Welsa Whitfield, Phoebe Snow, Stanley Jordan, Kenny Garrett, Paquita Devera, Rockapella, and others. He has also worked with choreographer Stacey Tukey, three-time Emmy nominee for her choreographer, choreography on Foxes So You Think He Can Dance, and her production of Moments Defined in both New York and California. He is the co-author of the last three versions of the Light Right Manual and Tutorial, the industry standard software for tracking lighting paperwork. Jorge is a member of United Scenic Artists Local 829. Jeffrey Peterson is an alum of the College of Fine Arts, is the production manager at Boston Playwrights Theater. He fancies himself a maker. Creative contemplation is his raison d'etre. He firmly believes in the transformative power of live theater and in its potential to heal to educate, to contextualize, to empower, to dislodge, to humble, to ignite, to quicken, to delight, and also to entertain. His introduction to the possibilities of collaborative art through theater came first at Minnesota's Perpich Center for the Arts Education in Minneapolis. In 2003, Jeffrey earned a Bachelor's of Fine Art with concentrations in scenic design and performance from the University of Minnesota Duluth. Jeffrey holds a Master's of Fine Arts degree from Boston University, where he was honored to study under James Newnan. He lived many lives and wore many hats over the years. He is currently Technical Director and Production Manager for the award-winning Boston Playwrights Theater at Boston University. He likes to ask questions and to seek answers, and he readily admits that our world is colored in varying shades of gray. Our third and final speaker is Kat Zhao. She is lighting designer and recent MFA graduate of the BU School of Theater. Recent theater credits include Wolf Play, Company One, Marie and Rosetta, Greater Boston Stage Company, and the Book Club Play at Boston Playwrights Theater. Opera credits include The Rake's Progress at the BU Opera Institute, The Cunning Little Vixen at BU Opera Institute, Glimmerglass and the 2009 Run Amok Festival at American Modern Opera Company. As an assistant lighting designer, she has worked with the ART, Huntington Theater Company, Ballet X, Odyssey Opera, and the Cincinnati Opera. Notable assisting projects include The Black Clown at ART Lincoln Center and Moby Dick, also at ART. She has also formally served as the president of the Harvard, Radcliffe, Gilbert and Sullivan Players, as well as the artist in residence at the Signet Society. She received an AB in mathematics from Harvard College and has an Erdush number of three. Thanks to Jorge, Jeffrey and Kat for being here today. The floor is all yours. 
Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, thank you to everybody for being here. Um, this is very exciting. It's been a little bit of a long time coming. Uh, it's been pushed off by the pandemic a little bit, uh, but we're here, which is uh, fantastic. Um, I did want to take a moment to um, uh, to acknowledge that uh, a lot of the work of the people that you are seeing in this presentation uh, today, uh, they're, they're out of work at the moment. Our industry is really uh, hurting by this pandemic. Uh, so it's, it's very hard. So uh, I'd like to celebrate the work that they are all, uh, that they all put into the show and that they uh, hope that we, we're able to get past this. Um, uh, very soon. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I am going to uh, go ahead and start a screen share and um, we'll get going here. All right, so so stage design, page to stage. Uh, we were talking originally when, uh, when uh, coming up with the idea for this webinar about putting together a uh, sort of a process through one show. How does a show start from the very beginning? And, and, and let's discuss the, the creative process uh, of getting this show uh, on stage. So uh, that's what we've done, hopefully. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll try to cover, um, we'll try to cover everything beginning to end. You'll see the product uh, hopefully by the end here. Uh, so let's get started. Um, so Odyssey Opera, the production we're going to be talking about is Maria Regina de Inglaterra. So you have to say it with a little gusto, right? Uh, being put on by the uh, by Odyssey Opera. They did uh, last year, uh, they did a season of Tudor operas, uh, which was uh, an interesting theme uh, to put together. And, um, you know, they really got into it, these folks. Um, with their marketing, but uh, this was their lineup uh, for their season and uh, uh, they, it did quite well from, from what I understand. Uh, for us, in this case, we'll, we'll be talking about this particular show. Uh, but first off, I wanted to uh, back up just for a moment so that you understand uh, some of the organizational structure uh, of theater companies in general, uh, at least of the larger theater companies. The smaller theater companies uh, are a little bit different, but, um, but just to, to put you into, so, so you understand how everybody kind of fits together. Uh, the basic organization usually has a board of directors, and then there's an artistic director and a managing director um, who actually put the seasons together. Now, the managing director has accounting department, marketing, box office development, all that stuff, uh, which I personally am not privy to that end of things so much. So uh, I fall in the other line of the tree uh, under the artistic director. Usually there's a production manager and a director. Now the production manager then has a technical director working for them. The technical director is then in charge of the shop crew as well as the run crew for the show. There's also the stage manager, which is also in charge of the run crew and in charge of the performers. And if, uh, if the show has a choreographer, then the, the choreographer works under the director directly with the performers. Um, if it doesn't have a choreographer, then the, it's director to performer. Uh, right there. And then there are the designers, which is where, where we fall into, into place here. Um, and now this is in opera, things change a little bit in that the artistic director is really the conductor. Uh, and so the conductor is a, is, a, is a voice that becomes very, very present in the room. And that's a little bit different from what we work in, uh, in the theater. Uh, in this case, the conductor is Gil Rose, um, who's also the head of the company. Our director was Steve Mailer. And then we have our designers. We have costumes, set, and lighting, depending on the show. Um, there might be other designers in place. But for opera, there's not usually a sound designer. Um, but in this case, we had costume set and lighting. Uh, the costumes that you will see are by Brooke Stanton, uh, set designed by Jeffrey Peterson. Yeah. Jorge, so sorry to interrupt you, but um, there's a build effects window covering the right side of the screen. Oh, interesting. Oh, thank you for your, thank you for that. Thank you. Oh, is that better? Perfect. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Interesting. That's not, wasn't showing up on my screen. Thank you for that. Um, 
So we have the conductor, Gil Rose, director Steve Mailer, our designers, costume set and lighting. Brooke Stanton is our costume designer. Jeffrey Peterson with a very nice headshot, Jeffrey, by the way. Good work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, my, I was the lighting designer. And then uh, we had assistants that worked with us to help to realize the, the design. And of course, in my case, that's where Ket comes in. And uh, she was invaluable throughout the process. Uh, it's the kind of thing where if my head wasn't screwed on, Pat would know where it is. And, uh, you know, because I would totally lose it. So uh, she was absolutely invaluable. That's fantastic. Um, so here's our cast for this opera. <clears throat> uh, and uh, they, did a, they did an amazing job. They were such good people and they were so generous uh, and great artists as well. And uh, almost, uh, almost better was also the fact that both Leroy and uh, James are our BU. Leroy is a grad of the Opera Institute. I think two years ago he graduated, and uh, James is in the is a voice faculty uh, for the program. So uh, it was great to work with with them uh, on this project as well. So Maria Regina di Inglaterra uh, by Nicola Piccini. No, it's not Piccini. It's not Puccini. It's Pacini. It's the other Ini. Um, I get them mixed up all the time. At first, when I, when I saw this opera, I was like, wow, a Puccini opera I haven't heard. Oh, no, wait, it's not Puccini, it's Pacini. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, so he's a little bit lesser known than, than uh, these other folks. Uh, but Pacini is a contemporary of Rossini, Donizetti, and Bellini. If you know opera, then uh, hopefully you recognize some of these folks. And they all were very much in competition, and they really influenced each other um, in that period in time. Um, this is a bel canto style opera. It is towards the latter end of the bel canto style. Uh, bel canto style employs multiple types of legato. So legato is how the phrasing sort of ties together very smoothly. Staccato is very specific, very um, pointed kind of um, singing. It demands vocal agility. There were some uh, passages in this opera that were absolutely, absolutely challenging. They were just brutal. It was amazing to, to hear it. Uh, performers need to be highly skilled in executing highly florid passages. So there's a lot of coloratura, which is the, all the, the various, as the note is coming down, uh, it's really quite, um, quite interesting. Uh, the register and tonal quality of the voice matches the emotional content of the words. The notes are clearly articulated and words clearly enunciated which for some people, there are some operas in which you can barely understand what they're singing. Uh, in, in bel canto opera, you should be able to, to, to really hear the words. Um, and there are frequent alterations of tempo through quickening and slowing of the overall time. So these are just some of the, um, the important parts of the bel canto style. Oh, and the vibrato is uh, reserved for some certain specific moments as well. Um, so, before we get too far here, I need to give you a synopsis because the, the opera is very, very complicated. There are a lot of very subplots and it's quite complex. Uh, so I thought I would simplify it for you so you, you understand what we're looking at. So we have Maria and she is the queen of England. Now the events of the opera are actually completely fictional, but we're using Maria, I guess, as the subject. And she is in love with the Fenimore. And Fenimore, of course, is the tenor, because in opera, everyone loves the tenor, of course. Uh, and he loves her back, which is, um, that's kind of convenient, except for the fact that Fenimore is in love with Clotilde, the other soprano. So we have two sopranos and a tenor. You see where the love triangle is happening here. She loves him back. Now, Clotilde is only a, a commoner, so, um, you know, he's in love with the queen and with a commoner, so that's kind of interesting. Um, and you think this is all nice and neat. However, Clotilde has got a little secret. She is in love with Ernesto. And not only in love with Ernesto, but she is betrothed to Ernesto. They are going to get married. So now our love triangle becomes even more complicated. And she's uh, also and Ernesto's uh, ward. Yes, correct. That kind of gets a little funky. I know Ernesto's picture looks very young. Ernesto is supposed to be an older, um, an older actor and is supposed to be a, a, a I think her adoptive father. Yeah, they fall in love and they, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so we have Gualtiero comes in, of course, the bass that always is, uh, uh, he is the Lord Chancellor for Maria. 
and he is very loyal to Maria, loves Maria as a, you know, is very loyal to her. So he finds out about this uh, little love thing that's happening between Fenimore and Clotilde, and he is not too happy about that. Uh, he also uh, tells Ernesto that that's happening. And so now Ernesto does not like Fenimore. So nobody's liking the tenor here. He's kind of in a pickle, right? That's no good. Well, Gualtiero tells Maria about this little uh, Fenimore Clotilde thing that's going on and gets Ernesto to, uh, to come up with a story that Fenimore paid him to kill Maria. And Ernesto reveals this. And so Maria is just not happy about that when somebody is you know, plotting to kill you. So now he knows that Fenimore has somebody else. He knows that Ernesto is plotting wanting to kill him, so Maria sentences both to hang. However, Maria's got a soft spot for Fenimore. He really, she really loves him, so, but she can't decide. She can't, she can't be seen to, to give in. So what does she do? She passes the buck to Clotilde and says, you choose <laughs> and pick one of them, save one of them. You choose which one it is. And of course she wants Fenimore to be saved, but uh, doesn't want it on her hands anyway. Um, so Clotilde has got a decision to make, except for the fact that Gualtiero intervenes and makes sure that Fenimore is the one that hangs and Clotilde and Ernesto end up together, happy ever after, and Maria is heartbroken. So that's a nutshell. There are a lot of subplots going on over here, but it's, it gets a little, it, that's the cleanest way I can present this for you. Um, so this opera has uh, been lost in time um, it's when it came out, it was a huge success. Uh, I think there were reports that Puccini was actually carried on, you know, the shoulders of the crowd, which I can't imagine nowadays, like Limonol and Miranda being paraded down Times Square or something. Um, so it was a great success for about a decade, but then Bel Canto started being seen as an old fashioned style. Uh, and a good chunk of that is that this, this guy you may have heard of named Verdi came onto the scene and just kind of took to opera world by storm and with his uh, style of opera. And so uh, the opera kind of faded into, uh, into obscurity for uh, many years. And uh, its biggest weakness really being the libretto. As you saw, I tried, to, I tried to simplify it for you, but it's actually quite a complex um, piece of work and you're, you're not always, doesn't always make sense. Um, but you know, in opera really, the, the story is really kind of an excuse really for the singing and for the music. So you have to kind of think of it a little differently um, than a play. Um, uh, Pacini does have another opera that actually uh, lived on and was a little more popular uh, for longer term. It's still, still around, it's called Sacco. Um, but really this one was, was lost to obscurity until about 1983 when opera Rara um, uh, discovered it and uh, performed it for the first time uh, since it was essentially since that or original period. But it's such a complicated and, and problematic piece that uh, it's been relegated to essentially these uh, compilations of opera music because some of the operas, uh, some of the music is absolutely gorgeous and brilliant. So, um, so there's great, great music in there. Uh, it's, the story is kind of, kind of weighs it down a little bit. Um, in 2012, it was produced by City Theater in Gießen of Germany. Um, I took a very adventurous uh, sort of visual landscape to this, uh, to this opera. Um, so this is where we start. And this is uh, maybe a great place for um, Jeffrey to, to um, jump in on, uh, <clears throat> on his part of the process. So it, you know, for me, it usually begins with a site visit. The theater, I have to go visit it. I have to see it. Uh, what are the hanging, where can I put lights? Uh, what is the perspective that the audience is, is, is um, getting? At, are there any physical challenges that we need to be aware of? Um, for me, I had seen shows at Huntington, at Huntington but I had not actually um, designed there. So I had to go and actually visit the theater and, and look at some of the technical equipment. Jeffrey was pretty familiar with, with the Huntington already. So his process may be a little bit different, but maybe Jeffrey, yeah. tell us a little bit about what you look for and what you see when you're going on a site visit in the theater. Of course, yes. Um, so many of you alums know that this used to be the Boston University Theater. Um, so I was quite fortunate to have gone to school and this was my classroom. So this is, um, when I was a graduate student, this is kind of um, this was my laboratory, as it were. 
Um, so I was very familiar with this space. And of course I'd seen many productions here and had, had um, worked in this space before. Um, but, you know, a set designer is obviously going to be concerned with um, sight lines. Um, you know, they want to, they want to think about, um, you know, the, the, the space itself, um, you know, how, do, how does the room influence um, what's going to be happening on stage? Is it somewhat separate or is it, is it, is it part of the stage picture? All of those, all of those kinds of um, considerations are part of a site visit. Um, there are other technical considerations that a set designer might think about. Um, you, know, you look for um, technical capacities, whether there's a fly house or if there's space in the wings, um, if there's a trap, where the orchestra, uh, is there an orchestra pit or will the orchestra need to be a part of the stage picture? Uh, those were the kinds of things that um, you'd sort of mull over uh, as, a, as a designer doing a site visit. Um, so uh, the director and I, Steve, Steve Mailer, we've, we've worked together, we've worked together a number of, of shows and we've, we sort of had a pretty decent rapport. And um, the interesting thing about this project is it sort of came to us both very late. Um, so Steve received a call from the company um, asking if he'd like to, dis like to direct the piece. And, um, you know, the director typically pulls together the design team. So Steve asked me if I was available and if I'd be interested um, in working on these with him. And we had probably about three weeks uh, or four weeks really to get the design pulled together. Um, so it's really fast. It's very fast, particularly for an opera and, and, and an opera that's as convoluted and complex and, and mysterious as this. So. Odyssey Opera is a company that specializes in um, kind of pulling these pieces from obscurity and kind of breathing new life into them. So this was, this is an example of a piece that um, none of us, we didn't have a roadmap. Um, you know, the staging was something that would need to be invented. And um, so to have, yes, such a sort of truncated design um, was a challenge, but it was also kind of exciting. Um, you know, so trying to distill all of that, all of that plot, um, of course there are locations and practical considerations in terms of the movement of the piece that need to be considered. But um, ultimately what Steve and I were interested in doing was kind of trying, I guess we were sort of interested in trying to find a metaphor that sort of um, could, could work to contain the story in its entirety. Um, our budget was about $25,000, which seems kind of like a lot of money. In fact, it is a lot of money, but um, if you've seen shows in the um, Huntington Avenue Theater, you realize that there's quite a volume of space um, that, that needs to be filled up. We needed to be quite deliberate with our, with our choices. Um, and and um, I guess sort of what we came up with in terms of um, a design is really, it was about, um, creating a space that was um, mysterious. And um, we looked at the historic character of Mary Tudor. Um, you know, she's, she's known as Bloody Mary. Um, history has sort of since kind of, history has not been kind to her. So the focus on the Marian persecutions and executions and, and, you know, having the Protestants burned at the stake and all of that sort of, colored my perception of who this person is. We don't actually meet the queen until the second act. Um, so the first act is all quite mysterious and um, it takes place on, on the Thames, on the banks of the Thames. There's a, there's a large boating parade and um, it, there's moonlight and th there's trees and um, there's a lot of atmosphere in that first act. And so as, as you'll see, the design is really quite stark and um, there was a lot sort of left to the imagination. Um, Shoshugiban is this thing that sort of Steve and I were kind of drawn to um, in part because of, you know, we looked at these pyres that people were burned at um, and the idea of this charred wood was really sort of interesting to us. Um, architecturally, we, we looked at a few um, modern, um, houses that that had used this siding and, and we were sort of interested in the, the idea of a slatting um, for a surround partly because it it kind of it looks it could look like um, it could look like a lot of different things I guess your imagination was we sort of let on the imagination of the audience to sort of 
take us to these different places? You know, is it prison bars? Um, is the whole thing a, a guillotine? It, you know, is it a forest? Um, so the the color palette also was quite pair like uh, spare. It was it was mostly like black and um, there was some gold um, brushed into the wood and there were some splashes of red here and there with with some of our props and and with the costumes. Um, maybe we can go to the next slide. Uh, so we did look at some history, like we 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 looked at like um, historic furnishings. We looked at uh, rooms that would have been um, rooms that Mary would have actually been in, like the Tudor Palace at Hampton Court, for example, is a real space. And this historic person would have actually been in this room. Um, this slide shows there's an example of um, a plaster seal, which, which ultimately became a motif that was used when we moved in the second act to the palace. Um, it was abstracted a bit, but you know that design is, is literally pulled from a room in England. Um, I mean, one of the things that we weren't really interested in doing is, is we weren't interested in, in creating a museum piece. Um, we wanted something that, you know, would allow for space, you know, so that the music could sort of take over and, and, and the people's imaginations could sort of color in and fill in all the details. Um, so, you know, I didn't have much time to work on this model. There was really only a few weeks, but this is, this is a um, part of the, you know, a small, half inch version of the actual set at the Huntington. Um, you can see that's what would become the act two screen. Uh, there was a rake with a very reflective floor. Um, the other piece that's interesting about the way that this came together, I forgot to mention, is that um, well, Jorge wasn't involved in the early meetings. So he, he, he wasn't a part of the conversations and, and, and how Steve and I talked and conceived of this piece is we, we knew that we needed to find a lighting designer who would be able to sculpt this environment. Um, and we were very fortunate that we found one who was able to sculpt the environment and sort of picked up on all the stuff that we were sort of interested in doing. Um, and I think when we get to the slides that sort of show um, the transformation of the space, you know, it, 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 the lighting and the costumes and, and everything sort of come together and, and they really create, um, I think what, what is a beautiful picture um, so this is again, this is another picture of the model. This is actually not um, an actual scene in the piece, but it sort of uh, shows you all of the, the disparate elements kind of pulled together. Um, so the, the thing that they're standing on is, is what's known as a rake. Um, Maria, the queen in the center of the picture is standing on a platform that would shift uh, from stage left to stage right. Um, the moon in the background is something that um, started at a very, sort of low trim and, and throughout the first act, slowly raised up. And um, that sort of slanty wall in the background, which looks kind of like the guillotine, if you will, um, is a wall that would, would also fly. So it was lowered down to become a, um, a prison gate um, or, or a, a barricade. And it also sort of slowly flew out to open the space and um, well, well, we'll sort of talk more about the execution, maybe as we get a little further into it. Yeah, and Jeffrey, I did want to explain something. Um, you'll else. notice what also that the 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 slatty walls don't really they don't engage with the floor. So um, we allowed the core. Uh, oh, I think we may have lost Jeffrey. Is he back? Hey, sorry about that. Let's see. Oh, that's okay. I'm back. <laughs> I can't quite see you, but I th I can hear you. Can you? Okay, great. Yes, there you go. There. You are. I did oh, want to take a that. second while, while we're paused, Jeffrey, just to explain what a rake yeah. is. Uh, so normally, if a stage floor is 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 flat um, to the audience, a rake really raises the back. So essentially, from the side, the performers are actually essentially performing on a little bit of a ramp. So I just wanted to explain what that term was. Yeah, um, and so then of course the, the, the platform there would need to be kind of rigged um, and there were wheels on it. So that was a kind of a, a technical, I don't know, <laughs> challenge for us. Yes, it was. Um, I think we can move on. 
Sure. Yeah, this shows a little more of the detail. Of the, yeah, this of the is slats. an interesting. It has some dimensionality to it. Yeah, so that was a that was a really sort of important piece. Um, so again, I mentioned that Jorge wasn't involved in the beginning of this, but I I knew that we needed to find a lighting designer who would understand that. Um, you know, there's this cadence to these slats. Each one of them is um, has a slightly different configuration or arrangement um, than the next. The only thing that's consistent is the three inch space in between. Um, so we knew that we wanted to play with the negative volume on the back side of the surround and then and then the front side of it, we knew that there would be an interesting opportunity for a lighting designer to sculpt the environment and um, really kind of like highlight um, the raised bits, if you will. And so part part of my job becomes making sure the the audience understand that this is not a flat piece, uh, that there is some dimensionality to it. Um, that's uh, really critical uh, for something like this, because I think it's very easy to make it look like a flat thing that just has slats coming down. Yeah. So um, uh, Brooke is not with us, the costume designer. So I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, the costume design, what she was thinking. So she wanted to take that Tudor inspiration um, and really modernize it. So, um, you know, you're seeing that sort of like in the show, the Tudors, which is really not a very period. These are, these are period inspired uh, costumes. Um, uh, but she really wanted to bring it even more modern. She said, you know, she wanted the cast to potentially even just be able to go out on a night uh, with their friends uh, in some of the costumes. So, um, so you see that inspiration of James Bond sort of carries over into our, our um, into our, our base Gualtiero. Um, some of the, there's, so there was research that was actual period research as well as slightly more modern research and trying to take some of those lines um, uh, from a high fashion, for example, and trying to capture them into uh, Maria's uh, costumes as well. Um, well. Calvin Klein inspiration here for our tenor that everybody seems to hate, I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, again, the period inspiration, the modern inspiration, and then uh, taking all of that into consideration when creating the, uh, the, the costume for each of the characters here. And she did a great job with these renderings. I mean, these costumes really are basically what, what, we, what we put on stage. Sometimes it's tricky to do that, especially if your budget is tight. You have to end up making some compromises uh, because of budget, but she really, really captured it you know, from her renderings, which was great. So uh, design meanings have happened, meaning the creative process is going. We have a sense of, of what the world might be. We have a starting point for the world. And so we begin production meetings, which is, uh, you know, the design staff and the director also meet with some of the technical folks, the production manager and the folks who might be building some of the stuff. Or, um, and we start talking about the world and we really start talking about all of the challenges that, it, that are presented in front of us in terms of time, budget, labor, uh, how do we put this together? Uh, and it's a really exciting time because you're really kind of collectively shaping the world. Um, and I think something that I loved so much about this particular process is that Jeffrey is such an open collaborator, um, which you don't always find. Uh, I do sometimes shows where um, you know, the set designer kind of does their own thing and they're not so open to, to, to a conversation about the, uh, those decisions. And so they do their thing, I do my thing. Uh, but, but Jeffrey was, and I, I think, I hope we were very open with each other um, during this process. And Steve is also such a, a generous director as well uh, with all of that. So, um, yeah, I, so I just like to, one thing that's really interesting about this, um, you know, so this is the first presentation of the model. Um, and this, mm -hmm. I think is the first time that Jorge had seen the model. Mm -hmm. So uh, we all right. kind of gathered together yet. Um, Steve and I had not quite figured out, um, there's a very, very important part of the story. And we hadn't quite figured out how we were gonna tell that, you know, um, from a visual um, point of view. Um, Part of it was a technical question, um, but I think, you know, um, but it, I think it was, Jorge, correct me if I'm wrong, it was in this meeting that we kind of like cracked the nut and solved the puzzle, right? Is that right? Yeah, of the execution, right. Yeah, and yeah. We've had, we do have some good video of that as well. I think you had originally had a more traditional sort of gallows square structure with stairs going up um, to the top of the gallows, but it, it became, the part of the question became, uh, you know, sort of practical 
in terms of the finances, but also in terms of the amount of space. In that model box, you can see it looks like there's a ton of room, but there, there's so much technical equipment um, in that empty space that it was really tricky to fit it all in. And um, But we needed to make sure that whatever solution we came up with was really, really tied to driving the, the story, um, to telling the story of that moment. And so it was a really awesome back and forth of what if, what if, there were a lot of what if questions asked at this meeting, which was great. What if we do this? What if we do that? And it just gets everybody's sort of creative juices going. And man, we arrived at a really beautiful, beautiful solution for this moment. Um, and a, a lot of people, I think after the opera really talked about that moment. So I think yeah. it's, it's really special because of how it came about uh, as a collective effort. Um, so now we said, you know, we hopefully we've done some of the, the, the big creative work and uh, we have to implement this, uh, these ideas. Um, so we have to create drawings. Here you are, Jeffrey, grand plan section, et cetera, et cetera. Talk about a little bit about these. Yeah, so um, this, this uh, the drawing on the left is, um, as you're looking at your screen, is the ground plan. This is the drawing that we sort of all work from. Um, the director primarily works from this drawing in that it's sort of and the stage manager too because this sort of gives them a map and a location where um you know if you've got positions of actors or singers where they should where they should enter from where they should land where they should um and it's what, the overhead view the overhead view of the theater and the set and how it how the set fits into the theater more importantly exactly yeah and it also shows you um scenic shifts um if there are going to be pieces that are moving on stage mm -hmm. off stage you know there'll be an Act one, act two, act three positions for certain things. Right. Um, and and then towards, the, it, it, towards the top of the, the drawing, I did want to point out that there is a, um, uh, there's the staircase that we were talking about for the gallows for the, um, um, for the ending. So, oh, sorry, I backed it up on us, sorry. Whoa, hey. There we go. Uh, so I want you to uh, just keep an eye on it. You see what it is, it's actually, it's repeated. It looks like there's two of them, but what that, that actually is showing is the motion of, of the staircase when it's at center stage and then when it moves off. That's all that is shown. Um, ah, I keep clicking on it. Okay, well, that's sorry, all right. Jeffrey. So the other thing, um, all the masking is, is shown on this drawing as well. Um, so we know what we're looking at, what we're not looking at. Um, the next drawing is a section view, um, and the section is very important for lighting designers. I'm sure Jorge will talk about that in a minute. Absolutely. Um, it also is important, um, the thing about the Huntington Avenue Theater, a former BU theater, is this, this space has a very large, very high balcony. Um, so, you know, you need to accommodate and uh, anticipate sight lines um, from multiple angles. Uh, so that's kind of why we show a, a section view. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a side view. And then we have some some detailed views because the folks at the shop need to know how to um, how to build all this stuff. So um, there's a lot of drawings. This is actually not a hugely complex set in terms of this construction, right? So there weren't that many plates that had to be produced. Uh, if you're doing a big commercial Broadway production, we're talking about 50 different drawings easily um, for every piece of scenery. Everything needs to be detailed for the shop so they can build it. Um, so we see here the um, uh, a little more of detail of the gallow. This is the gallows that we were talking about. Um, yeah, and it ended so, up morphing. Yeah, so initially this structure would have existed upstage of that big sort of guillotine like wall. Um, and it would have been visible the whole time. Not a very Yeah, we solution. couldn't figure out how to hide it. That was part of it. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> also we would lose our crossover space because of the the staircase needed to have that return. Um, so the crossover that, meaning the, the actors would need to get from one side of the stage to the other without being seen so that they can enter from one side of the stage versus the other. And if there's no crossover behind the set, they won't be able to get from one side of the other. Um, so this is the drawing that went to the shop for bid. Um, but ultimately after that meeting, we came up with a new solution, uh, which, which was a rolling staircase. Um, and so the staircase itself became a part of the action of the scene. Uh, and it moved on on stage in interview of the audience, and it was it was um, timed with the music so that um, as um, Fenimore was was ascending the staircase, he was sort of in a slot of light, and he reached the top, and the music sort of there was a flourish, and that was that was as if that was his execution. Um, and Jeffrey, in the interest of time, I'm going to move us along. 
uh, yeah. we're running a little tight. So, uh, so then uh, I take Jeffrey's drawings and I create uh, my version, which is where all the lights go. This is called the light plot. Uh, again, it is an overhead view and it shows where each of the lights is, uh, is gonna go and what kind of light um, goes in that. Uh, now you see a whole bunch of symbols. Each one actually means something. And if we look on the upper right hand side of the, of the of the drawing, you see that this is where I tell the technicians what the light specifically is. So there's a symbol and it looks very similar. Um, over here, it tells the, the electrician what kind of light it is. And it's basically that little symbol in the front. You see one has an X, one has a slash, one doesn't have anything. That's how you can tell the different um, pieces of equipment apart. Um, and uh, that was all of the lights that were up in the air. This is a drawing from overhead with all of the lights that were on the ground level and where they were spread around, um, uh, which was a little bit of a challenge because I also have to think about things such as there needs to be enough space for actors to enter and exit safely um, and, um, and make sure certain things didn't, uh, could not be seen, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, uh, as Jeffrey mentioned, is the section view of the theater. And this is super important for me um, because as you see, if we look at this area, this is where all the lights are hanging. This is how high they are going to be. And if we look at that little symbol, it means that is the front row. And if the, if the audience member looks up, uh, what are they going to see? I need to figure that out. So here are the borders, which are black pieces of fabric that go across the stage to block technical equipment that is that is uh, behind it um, and I need those to figure out what will the audience see in this case the front row uh, if I if we look at this area you see that uh, that equipment is below that line so I knew that the front row would see that equipment and I just figured you know what the front front row or two are going to see it but once you move back a little bit they will not and I, I just didn't have another option in this show but back here you see all the equipment but also the scenery as you see is above the line, that means that the audience will not see it. So that's why, you know, these drawings are important as we really are figuring out what, what is the audience's experience. Um, all of that lighting equipment then gets distilled into multiple spreadsheets, which is cat's territory. And um, uh, every single light has a, has a slot on this, on, this, uh, on this sheet and it tells the technicians again, what, what color is it? What kind of light is it? What is it doing? What is its purpose? Where is it hanging? Uh, and all sorts of um, important information that way. Uh, so we move on to the bid process and, and construction, right? Oh, somebody has to make all this stuff. Um, so this is Jeffrey at the scene shop. Watching yeah, this all is the actually lumber all the lumber arriving. It's $20,000 worth of lumber there. Yeah, <laughs> arriving at the shop and uh, that eventually became our set. Um, so here's that, that hanging screen, the Tudor hanging screen that was going to be flying. Um, and uh, they did a really nice job with that, I thought. Um, uh, so for the, some fabric for the props to, to thrown in into the screen. Right. There's uh, a lot of decisions to be made by the by you know by Jeffrey and uh, you know, in terms of what are what are fabrics that are going to be used, what colors, what how shiny should things be. We also had the issue of the moon because we didn't have the budget to. Um, to, to make a moon from scratch, but it, uh, so we asked around and there were a few productions that had moons that we could actually rent because they, it was still in their stock. So the one on the left is, is kind of lights up from within, uh, but the one on the right, it turns out that the Huntington uh, had been doing Rosen Krantz and Gilder Stern are dead and they built a three dimensional moon. This was carved out of foam uh, and I, we all loved it immediately, I think. Yeah, and it was perfect. Not only was it perfect, but the, it was the show that was there right before us. And we said, just leave it there for us. And in fact, it was hanging in the exact spot that we needed it in the theater. It was the freakiest thing. We didn't even touch the moon. We just put our set under it and it just, it was, it was right. Uh, I've never had that <laughs> happen before. So that was kind of an, a good moment of serendipity. Um, so we enter into rehearsals. Uh, the cast receives a, a, a a presentation from the designers. You see Brooke Stanton there talking about the costumes uh, on the picture on the right. Uh, the cast needs to know what it, what are they going to be wearing? What does this world feel like? So that they can start to envision what this is. On the left, you see that the model on the top left, um, Steve is talking to the to the uh, principals about the set and what it you know what uh, they can visualize where they're going to be. 
Um, that's a really, really important thing. Uh, once they are through a, a good chunk of rehearsals and things are sort of moving, uh, then that's where uh, I come in. And there I am in the picture on the left. I'm watching this for the first time in the rehearsal room. I'm listening, I'm watching to see uh, where the actors are. I'm taking notes about their locations. Anything I discover that wasn't on the page, um, that's, I wanna write it down. I need to know when it happens. Uh, and then we start loading into the theater. And here we are, the technical folks that worked so, so hard in a very short amount of time. Um, they did a brilliant job putting all of this together. Um, there are a couple of BU uh, alums in this photo as well. That's right. Yes. yes have quite a few folks right. from BU are still working here in town or used to be yeah. before pandemic yeah. times. Yeah, we had several folks working backstage with us. It was great. So once the uh, set is loaded in, we go into technical rehearsals, which everybody uh, colloquially calls tech. Uh, and it has both good and bad connotations, <laughs> that word. Um, so the first thing that happens is a sits probe. This is the, the cast first chance to hear the music with a full orchestra so that they, they know what this is going to sound like. Um, what, what is their voice in this room going to sound like when everybody is playing? So try to get close to show conditions. During the rest of the technical rehearsal process, a full orchestra is too expensive uh, to have in the pit. So usually it's only a piano for most of the technical rehearsal. Um, so this is their chance to really hear it and know what, it, what it's gonna sound like. Um, the folks backstage, the, the, you know, working on the wigs, um, very, very detailed young. work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we're getting set for technical rehearsals. You see there's a table right there in the center of the orchestra. Um, that's where uh, the lighting uh, department kind of lives. Uh, Jeffrey usually finds a spot over to the side. Um, and here is Steve at the tech table, uh, right in front of the tech table, directing uh, the, the folks say, hey, why don't you move further upstage? Because from my point of view, it looks better when you do this, those kinds of things. And we're making decisions. Uh, the actors know the technical process means you stand around a long time and wait. You stand and wait. Uh, so they were incredibly patient about waiting for, for all of the technical elements to come together. And Jeffrey has to wait too. <laughs> this, this is my work time. But at the same time too, you know, I always sort of encourage the set designer to be an active part of the creation of the world as well. I, t I, t I said, you know, if you see something, tell me. I, I point something out. That's okay. Uh, and I think um, he was great about, uh, you know, noticing things that I may not be so focused on. So it's great to have, you know, kind of a fresh set of eyes on all of this. Um, so there we are at the tech table making, uh, making the, the like cues. And we see that staircase that we talked about before. And I actually have some video at that moment, uh, which we'll see in a little bit. The backstage folks, again, some BU grads, which is kind of great. Um, sometimes the cast is not available. Uh, so we need to have a stagehand stand there <laughs> and, and so that I can light the, the scene. Um, so it's not a great picture, but it kind of, it's a, a cool moment. Uh, and here's also Kat's domain. This is what Kat, as the assistant, is doing, is keeping track of everything. Every little detail um, has to be tracked. Um, and she produces a lot of paperwork. So we move on to dress rehearsal. And uh, this is the opening. You might be hearing a little bit of music in the background as I put little clips from the, from the music. Uh, in the front, there is a, a scrim, which is a fabric that is kind of partially see-through. And I'm projecting some templates right, in, right on it so that we can see the set behind it. Um, we then fly that to reveal the, the cast and um, the opening scenes. And um, you can clearly see those costumes, as I said, the period influence, but having a modern sensibility um, uh, that Brooke did. Um, this is a great shot too to um, highlight that uh, we talked about the set had the slats had some depth to them. This is part of what, you know, I was, by scraping the back wall with light, I can pick up on that three dimensionality of the slats because the light's coming kind of from the side and scraping across. We see the moon that was hanging in the perfect place there all come together. Um, here's the screen and the wall. So we are in, uh, Maria's in the palace and Maria's having a very internal moment. Uh, part of my job is I'm almost like the film editor 
where I need to draw the audience's eye. I need to tell them where to look when the stage is fully open. So here you can see, hopefully your eye went right to Maria, which is where you should be paying attention to at the moment. Everybody else is frozen, so they're in a much darker tones. Uh, this is the end of Act Two. Uh, big rousing number, a uh, lot of energy, and you see they're all focused on the conductor so that they are all, all right there on the music. Um, Jeffrey mentioned that the back wall would fly up and down and sometimes we had cast members on the other side of the wall. Um, and uh, this was a moment in which it felt like a, <clears throat> you know, they couldn't get into the palace. Um, and so that, that flying wall really helped in that moment. Um, again, I'm drawing your eye. I'm telling you where to look in a stage full of actors, right? Hopefully you, 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 your eye was drawn right to the soprano. <clears throat> Uh, again, this is uh, uh, the crowd trying to get into the into the jail, I think, in this case, right, I believe. Um, and the, the guards up there are trying to hold them back. I'm drawing your eye. So this is inside the jail. This is the tenor having a, a lamentable moment that he's about to die. Uh, and this is also, this is a brutal, brutal, brutally difficult song. It was very long and it's very, very high. <laughs> uh, so he really, really tried hard. It was, it was, it was a tough song. <clears throat> and uh, those are the guards in the back. And notice that their 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 clothing's red. I needed to make sure that that's the color that we see, that we saw. Um, so that took some work getting it to that point where those guards really looked like they had red red coats. Um, that for the execution, we had this beautiful moment that we've been kind of. Uh, talking about and here it is this is kind of like as the the staircase is moving um, the actor is is going up the stairs so that the actor always stayed center focused and they just essentially rose up of this white um, strip of light which was um it was a really great moment and then when he is executed uh, basically the strip of light behind them turned red and that was the only indication that he had been executed we didn't have a hanging we didn't want to be quite that literal um and it, it turned out to be a very very powerful moment and very different from what we saw um and then as we head into the finale uh the final moments it's a little bit of sadness and you see how lighting then is going to change the mood because the the music changes towards the end and it grows and it grows almost a little more hopeful and from this moment so it's a brighter stage and then it also warms up a little bit as her hopes rise for the future um, so it's essentially the same cue but it just warmed up and became brighter um, and brought up the energy and that is it that is the show I hope that um, that illustrates what we were trying to do, what we were going after. And um, uh, that was um, interesting for everybody to see the behind the scenes, how it all comes together. It's a lot of work. Uh, it is a ton of work. And, it, uh, and also commendable for Jeffrey, I wanna say too, because it, you know, in opera, you should have a lot more time to put this together. Um, I, I have friends of mine who design an opera and they're working two or three years ahead of time. Uh, on, a, on the big operas at the Met and uh, the Glimmer Glass and things like that. It takes them about two, three years to put that together. So to having four weeks, I think it was it was a stellar job. So we, um, I noticed there are a couple of questions here in the Q&A. Yeah, um, absolutely. Did you have to see these? Yeah, we have a um, question from Kate's, Kate. Hi, Kate. Um, Kate Snodgrass. Okay. <laughs> uh, so the question is, if the slots and walls are painted black, how did you get them to change color? That's for Jorge. Oh, thank you. Yes, absolutely. It's a big challenge. Uh, I, any throw, any light I throw at it is gonna suck. <laughs> it's gonna suck all that light. It's really more about intensity than color. Black is actually very neutral. It's a very neutral, so it'll take whatever color you want. It's really more about intensity. So I did have to think about that. Um, There's also a silver metallic glaze over the whole thing. Right, which, which also silver. helps, absolutely. Uh, and it was very subtle and it helped to reflect some of the light. But yeah, I, I, working on sets that are primarily black are it's very challenging. I have to throw a lot of light at it. So it's just a lot of equipment and wattage and all those things. <laughs> we have another question. Um, I think there, there was a question. Wasn't there a question about blocking? Um, how much? How much?
to the blocking changes. Um, I'm not sure where it went. It may have. Um... Yeah, I um, I typed an answer to it. There was a question about um, whether ha from Dennis, how many, if any, changes to blocking and lighting happen after the first show, i.e., are there previews? Um, yeah, we didn't have a preview. We had an invite address for this one, if I'm recalling correctly. Yeah, partly. Partly. Um, I mean, so this this production only had two performances in. Um, mm -hmm. the Huntington Avenue Theater, uh, and we had one invited dress. So uh, because of the, sh you know, the short nature of this and the fact that we didn't have work time, um, you know, Jorge, you can probably talk more about what mm -hmm. it's like working professionally, you know, in yeah, terms, absolutely. like I just came off of a show at the Huntington where we had like weeks of previews where we were making lots and lots of changes, um, yes, but not, up not until, on a show like this. Up until opening, it's fair game uh, to, to make changes for, you know, moving the actors to a slightly different. Even I've had script changes like the day before opening. So um, it becomes trickier the closer you get to opening to integrate those changes. Um, once the show opens, however, uh, we call it locked. That means that no changes are possible because we, the designers, we go away. And if the director wanted to move an actor from this side of the stage to the other, they may no longer be lit properly. So uh, after opening, if the show's running long enough, if the director wanted to make a change, they would actually have to hire me again for that additional time, basically for the day uh, to come in, but also needs to hire all the technicians that it takes to, to make that happen as well. So it becomes a very expensive proposition for them. So usually after opening, there are no blocking changes, but up until opening, yeah, it's, it's fair game. So sometimes, you know, if you get a ticket to a preview performance and you see uh, a group of folks sitting in the back row with notepads and monitors, it's, it's likely the lighting designer, the assistant lighting designer. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, looking, and previous, I have to watching. say, I, I kind of enjoy going to the early previews because they're still, the show's running, but not everything has been worked out perfectly necessarily. And you, you can run into some really surprising things. Uh, the show may stop, may, it literally it may have to stop for a safety issue or... You know, Spider-Man Turn of the Dark and on Broadway, <laughs> it was famous for having to stop due to safety concerns with the flying performers, which are flying all over the theater. It was very complex. Um, so it took them nine months to tech that show, which is unheard of. It's uh, just amazing the amount of money they, they spent on that. Um, but yeah, during preview periods, it does change. And we do get a little work time during the day to adjust for those changes. Um, the most common rhythm is that um, if, after a preview performance in the morning, there are notes, meaning uh, the technical crew can make any adjustments to the equipment that needs to happen. In the afternoon, there might be a rehearsal with the cast and that's where we kind of shuffle people around or change timings. And then we would take a dinner break and then there would be the show. And we do that throughout the, the preview period. Another, do we have more questions? We have a logistical question about whether the slides will be made available to the um, audience members after this presentation. Oh boy, uh, maybe contact me directly. I think that would be the, the best thing to do. Uh, I'm on the BU website. So if you would like the slides, let me know. Um, the photos I believe are on my website as well. I don't know, Jeffrey, you have some shots up, right? Yep, uh, and I have the, on my website as well, um, different mm -hmm. ones. Right. Yeah. So if you'd like the slides, let me know. I will link those websites Thank in the you. chat. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. I think we're, we're at four o'clock. How's that team? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just wanted to, to pop on. My name is Tracy Ricciardi. I'm the Assistant Director of School-Based uh, Alumni Relations at BU. And I just really want to thank Jorge, Jeffrey, and Kat for this fantastic presentation and all the work that went into it. Um, and thank you also to all the attendees for joining us today. Um, you will receive um, a copy of the recording of this webinar in your email on Monday. Um, you can see the full list of our upcoming events on the BU Alumni Relations webpage at bu.edu slash alumni slash events. And we just hope you all have a fantastic weekend and thank you again for joining us. Thank you, everybody.